Uh, there we go. My name is Pat. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Pat. <laughs> I'm grateful to be sober. I'm grateful to be here. I swear every time I'm in the Zoom land or in the Hollywood squares, I, I say, my name is Pat. I'm an alcoholic. I still wait for everyone to say, hi, Pat. And I look at everyone's faces and they're kind of like, you know what I mean? It's kind of weird. It's still weird. I know we're, I know we're getting used to it. I don't know about you. It takes me about a year to get used to things. So I think we're in the flow of it. But um, I still wish I could hear that. Hi, Pat. And uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. I, Carol just heard me other, the other day. I'm thinking, oh, man, poor Carol's got to hear me again, you know. And uh, it's good to see some friends. And thank you, Glenn. Happy birthday. In California, we say happy birthday. In other places, you say other things. But the 10th of October. And uh, my sobriety date's October 23rd, 2002. I know you did say who's celebrating in the month of. But I don't like no fronts here. I don't like to celebrate early. So on the 23rd, I'll have 19 years of sobriety. And, and thank goodness for uh, for the old timers in my group, a man by the name of Tom Whalen. A lot of the old timers might remember him at Laguna Beach. He lived in L.A. for a long time. And, but uh, I, I, I was brand new. And, and he said, welcome, new guy. And I was like, oh, new guy. You know, so like afraid of the of, of P.I. is afraid of people, period. But the old guys intimidated me. You know, there was a lot of old timers in my home group, the South Coast Speakers Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, 55 years, Johnny Crean, uh, um, John Ackerlin, he had like 45 years, Lynn Wilder had 45 years, uh, Frank O'Rourke had 45 years. That's just a couple of them, you know, and uh, they intimidated me. And, 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 uh, and Tom Whalen, Tommy Whalen, he'd say, welcome new guy every week and welcome new guy every week. And one day I finally got, got my ego back. So I asked him, I said, well, well, how long am I new for? I thought they say a newcomer is only 30 days. And he said, well, you're new until you get a year. I was like, all right, I guess I'm new till I get a year. And then I got a year and I went up to him. I was like, guess what, Tom? I said, I got, I got a year. I'm no longer a new guy. He said, oh, you're new until you get five years. <laughs> I was like, oh man. All right. So then I got five years. And then I said, hey, guess what, Tom? I got five years. I'm no longer a new guy. He said, you're new until you're 10. And so I said, oh man. So then I, at, at 10, I said the same thing. He said, you're new to your 15 and, and uh, at 14 years uh, sober, he passed away. And uh, I guess that means I'll always be a new guy. I, I hope that I remain teachable in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, 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 um, I need you guys more today than when I got sober on October 23rd, 2002. Um, you know, and, and, and I'm grateful for my sponsor, who keeps me right size. You know, I, I, I got some fears. I got some things that happened yesterday. Uh, you know, it's like, uh, well, in four days, we might be letting you go. You know what I mean? It's like four days of like, holy cow, you might, you know, should I hang in there or should I try to find something else? And, and I, and, and I'm loyal and I want to stay loyal. And I'm just like, oh my God, what do I do fear? You know what I mean? I think I have an ulcer in about six hours. I, I've completely uh, created an ulcer in my mind, which I know I have one. So I've been online looking at ulcers and, and what the symptoms are. I don't know if you go down the rabbit hole like that, but I do. I have alcoholism. My mom used to say I don't have alcoholism, you know, and uh, it's alive and well. And, and uh, but, I, you know, this morning was a new morning. I got well, it wasn't a new. Well, it was a new morning, but I got on my knees and I said, God, please, if you see fit, allow me to help at least one person today, you know. And uh, and so I'll go out and, and uh, I'll do the best of my ability to help uh, somebody out out today. And um, I'll go with the attitude of love and service in the mix of wondering what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, there's some actions that I can take and, and I'll take some actions. But, uh, you know, so thanks a lot for having me. I need you guys today. I need you guys today. It's nine o'clock in the morning over here and I need you. And I didn't know I was going to need you when, when you asked me, Glenn. Uh, but uh, the old timers taught me, they just say, you just say yes to Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, well, why do I got to say yes? I'd rather go hang out with the girls smoking outside. He said, you say yes, because that's where God wants you to be. And uh, so I say yes, and I show up, and, and God does magical things in my life. I know today that, that whatever's happening is going be, to be better than I could ever imagine, because that's my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. Those that are in their first year, you're new to forever. So uh, just keep being new. You know, that's, uh, you know, I got tricked, but uh, I'm gra grateful I got tricked. But those old guys were slick, you know. They were real slick, you know. I, I remember coming to my home group, the South Coast Speakers Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and uh, I was brand new. It's in Laguna. It used to be at 8 o'clock pre-pandemic. We 
we were at seven during Zoom and now we're at 7.30 in person. And, and uh, but I remember walking up to my home group and, and John Akron, I'll never forget the softness of that man's hand. He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, kid. And he grabbed my hand, he gave me a big old hug and it was like getting hugged by grandpa, you know? And he brought me in the meeting and he took me to the back of the room and, and uh, to where the coffee was, about 250 person speaker meeting and he took me to the back of the room and he gave me a half a cup of coffee one of those styrofoam cups you know it was a half a cup of coffee and i thought man he's pretty 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 selfish bro you should fill it all the way to the top you know and uh and my hand you know that he got the shakes and and he knew he he didn't want that coffee all over his floor of his meeting and uh, and then he gave me a half a donut which i thought man this guy's selfish can you give me a whole donut and then it was stale you know i thought oh this aa man this is what a what i've what's come to is this and, uh, and he brought me in the meeting into the second row of 250 people. And he, and he sat me in the middle of 10 chairs, right? Like four in. And, uh, and these old guys surrounded me and they talked about drinking and they were laughing and they were telling stories and they were laughing and they were telling stories and they were laughing. And, and, uh, and I'll never forget the, the unconditional love. I felt safe sitting amongst those guys. You know what I mean? I, I felt, I felt, a, I felt like I was part of, I felt like I was, was in the middle of something. I, I felt, um, I felt at home. I didn't know what home felt like in my whole life. It's been chaos inside the mind. I didn't know, but for the first time sitting with those guys, I felt a sense of peace and safety. And uh, the meeting started and I was vibrating out of my chair. You know what I mean, I was just like, wrong. You know, I have the nervous disposition. The big book talks about, I don't know if you got it. I still got it. You know, my fingernails are chewed. Well, I mean, Hey, it's Dodger giants, baseball, a little, little nervous but anyways normally right like i have it and uh and i'm sitting in that chair and i'm just vibrating you know what i mean and john would put his hand on my leg and he'd say don't forget to breathe kid you know what i mean i was like oh yeah breathe (sighs) you know and uh and uh and they'd put their hands on me and they'd just hold me there and and i I thought i had add you know what i mean they told me that it was selfish and self-centered behavior you know what i mean because she went crying i was like hey you know i was gonna go chase her outside he goes we don't leave during the meeting I, well, I got to go to the bathroom. He said, you go to the bathroom before the meeting and you go to the bathroom after the meeting. Sit down. It's disrespectful to get up. You know, I was like, all right. You know, I wanted that guy to like me. I want those old guys to like me. And, I, and I'm a believer that my fear of what you think of me kept me sitting in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want that acceptance from those guys, you know. And uh, and then after the meeting, he said, I want you to go thank the speaker. I said, I didn't even like the speaker. Why am I going to go thank him? And he said, because he drove all the way from Los Angeles, took him three hours to get to down here. Why don't you go thank him for driving from LA? And, and so I go sit in that, that greeting, that, that line to thank him at the end. And it felt like two hours of sitting there. Cause all I did was think about myself, me, 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 me. Why do I have to do this? And I don't want to do this. And I'm just, I'm uncomfortable. And, and I would sit there. It was probably only 10 minutes, you know? And, uh, and then I would say, thanks for driving from LA, you know? And, uh, and then I, then I come show up the next week and I go run up to those old guys because it felt safe when I felt a part of, you know, and, and I felt welcomed to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the, 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 the leader came up to me. And she said, oh, I'd like you to read. I'd like you to read the 12 traditions tonight. And John said, he's not reading. I, my feeling was hurt. I was like, hey, she's asking. He said, you're not dressed appropriately to be behind the podium. Next week, I want you to show up with a collared shirt in case you're asked to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, I said, all right, you know, and so the next week I showed up with a collared shirt, not because I wanted to be a service. I'm still a taker. You know what I mean? I wanted John to like me. So I showed up with a collared shirt and then they didn't ask me to read. And then I got resentful. They didn't ask me to read. I didn't want to read, but I got resentful anyways, you know, and, uh, you know, and uh, I, I uh, he said, you need to get a commitment. I said, what do you mean a commitment? I said, I'm new. You know, what about you guys? You guys. And he said, he's looked at me, he said, son, he said, you've been a taker your whole life. He said, what we're going to do here in Alcoholics Anonymous is turn you into a giver. And I uh, see so you go ask that girl if you could uh, do cleanup, you know, and uh, here I am doing cleanup, you know, and, and there's there's a there's a kid named Gus. And I met Gus. Now, me and Gus are cleanup crew, you know, and uh, I don't want to be the cleanup crew, but uh, I didn't want to go to the meeting next week. And I remembered, ah, sh- dang, I got to, I got to be the cleanup guy. And so I showed up to be the cleanup guy. Cause I wanted you guys to like me, not cause I'm a giver. Cause I wanted you guys to, I didn't want to let you, I want to let you down. And so I show up the next week to be the, to be the greeter. And, and, uh, you know, and, uh, I couldn't sleep. I was like, man, I, I can't get any sleep, John. And he said, come with me, kid. And he 
I thought he was going to give me the big book because I heard that joke, you know, if you can't sleep, read the big book, that'll put you to sleep, you know, and I, so I said, I can't sleep. So he took me to the, to the literature area and he, he gave me a book called Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. And, and I was like, what about the big book? He goes, he got like, why, why, go, what is this book? He goes, this is the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I said, why do I got to learn the history of Alcoholics Anonymous? Don't I have to do recovery first? You know, aren't I supposed to do the steps first? And he looked at me and he said, he said, son, he said, you need to, you need to learn and understand the history of the thing that's going to save your life. And you need to learn how to respect Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, man, I'll be forever indebted to that guy, you know. Simple little messages that I learned when I was brand new. And I'm so grateful for the old timers and Alcoholics Anonymous. And thank you for continuing to show up, to continue to be an example and pay them the, pay the, pave in the path for a guy like me to follow behind, you know. And all those guys have died, you know, and I remember talking, talking to them in the end. I said, I said, you know, how am I ever going to fill your shoes? And how am I ever going to hold the group together? Like you? he said, you just need to fill your own shoes. Don't worry about filling ours, you know, and you just teach the new guy exactly what we taught you. And, and so I show up to my home group and, and, and uh, you know, and I tell this, the, tell the newcomers, Hey, get off your phone, you know, and uh, no texting in the meeting, you know, and uh, you know, now I'm one of them curmudgeons you know what i'm saying and i try you know because i don't want i want the structure of my home group to be there like it was for me and they look at me and they get mad at me and and i and i don't like to be you know i want people to like me you know but but uh it's important for me that i carry that message so thank you guys for continuing to come here and i um i love aa when i first got here i was i Man, I remember when I first got here and I had people here like at Wiener. I heard you down there. I'm at Wiener and I'm a grateful alcoholic, you know. And I was like, oh, come on, Ed Wiener. Are you grateful? You know what I mean? I I, I go to the, they go to the, the detox and there's a big grateful people are happy people. And those that aren't, aren't, you know. So get grateful and you'll be happy, you know. And I would just think, come on, Ed Wiener. You know what I'm saying? You grateful alcoholic. I was like, I wasn't grateful for nothing. I, I got a disease of perception. I didn't learn. I didn't know that right at the time. I, I I didn't understand what was wrong with me. You know what I mean? My whole life, man, I was always looking at the negative in life. My whole life, there was something wrong with me. You know what I mean? There, it, it, just on the inside, man, just, I know today, right, that I have a spiritual malady, but I didn't understand that as a kid. You know what I mean? I didn't understand that, that I didn't have a father. You know, my mom was a blackout drinker which means I'll never know who my dad is. You know what I mean? But I remember looking outside my window, wonder if my dad was ever coming home. And uh, my dad, my, the car would come and the car would never turn in. And, and I established this idea as a little kid that I wasn't loved. That if my own dad didn't love me, you know, then, then God didn't love me. I had no, if my own dad, then nobody's going to love me if my own dad didn't love me. I remember being on the baseball team and I got a triple play in the wrong direction. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, I'm awkward, poopy pants kind of kid. You know what I mean? I, I'm like a strikeout kind of baseball player. You know what I'm saying? You know I mean? Keep your eye on the ball and you don't want, you don't want it to be the ninth inning, two outs, bases loaded and pats up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, even in little league, the coach is like, loser, man, we're going to lose the game because of him. And, uh, and one time I got triple playing the wrong direction. I was on second base. I remember looking at my mom and she's standing, the cra- you know, stands clapping, you know what I mean? She's so proud of her kid, you know, but I remember that day looking at her saying to myself, if I only had a dad that had never happened, you know what I mean? My whole life, man, I blame my life on not having a dad, you know, my, my whole life, it just seemed like everything wasn't right. You know, I have that angst on the inside. I have that nervous disposition. You know, I'm a bedwetter <laughs> pre-alcohol. I don't know if there's any other bedwetters pre-alcohol. I pee the bed till I was 10. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of shame and there's a lot of, there's a lot of that guilt. I just shame attached to that, you know, and I just alone and, and afraid and my whole life, you know, and, and I grew up in AA, you know what I mean? Like the love that I felt in this room, this Zoom room today, everyone welcome each other and people chat the talking and you know, when you're sitting in the meetings and you feel that camaraderie and you feel that love and that love that I got when I, I talked about my home group, like I felt that love my whole life. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't deprived of love, you know, I mean, but, but my perception to life was that no one loved me, right? There's something wrong in all that. And I could look at it today and I can see that the main problem of the alcoholic centers in the mind, man. My mind is constantly trying to separate me from you. My mind as a little boy is tra- always separating me from you. My mind is always lying to me about everything in my life, right? It's telling me things. It says things like, you know what? 
you're not an alcoholic. You know what I'm saying? 19, 18 years sober. Like if I don't, if I'm not consistent in this big book, right? Like it'll start chattering things to me. It doesn't chatter me in the idea of a drink today. It chatters me in the idea of like, you don't need to go to the meeting today. It chatters me today that I don't need to go call my sponsor. You're not, almost 19 years sober. You don't need dependence on him. It chatters on me that, you know what, like God doesn't love you. It chatters with me today differently than a drink. But those things drive me away from you. When I get far enough away from you, I stop the connection. I stop the identification. And then it says a drink is a good idea. Cunning, baffling, and powerful, man, alcoholism is. And as a little kid, I had a mind that was separating me from you. And I had no idea, man. I did not know what was wrong with me. You know what I mean? On the outside, my life was good. I knew what Alcoholics Anonymous was. I knew what, what alcoholism was. I knew that, that, that drinking wasn't good. I promised my mom as a little kid I wasn't going to drink and I wasn't going to do drugs. You know, and at nine years old, man, these kids pulled out a bottle of Jose Cuervo. And I didn't know what alcohol would do to me or for me. But um, I knew that if I didn't drink it that day, those kids weren't going to like me. And uh, that bottle went around. I got that bottle of tequila and I put that tequila back and I couldn't I didn't like the taste. It was disgusting. And I spit it out. And what happened for me was I was overcome with fear. And that fear told me that I was not going to be like the rest of my life. Right. That separator in the mind was separating me from those kids that day. And something inside of my mind connected that alcohol was going to connect me to those kids that day. And so that bottle got around to me the second time I took a pull off that thing and I talked myself into holding it down. And I can tell you the exact effect alcohol has on this alcoholic body was all that fear went away. Like in that moment, I felt like I connected to those kids. Like in that moment, I felt a part of, right? Like in that moment, something happened between me and you. And it was the most powerful experience, right? I didn't know at the time. But it was the most powerful experience that had happened in my life from nine years old from when I was born to then, right? Because it connected me to you. And from that moment till I got sober at 27, alcohol connected me to you. Alcohol allowed it to be okay on the inside. Alcohol quieted the mind that separated me from you, right? Alcohol allowed me to go. It gave me what the big book talks about, that sense of ease and comfort, you know? And I didn't know that at nine years old, and I couldn't get booze at mom's. I mean, she was going to AA, you know, so I couldn't steal booze at 11 years old. I took it at weed, and I didn't know I was going to AA. I didn't know, like, anything. I just hit the weed, and it connected me to you. By the time I was in high school, man, I was already blacking out in high school, man. I was already, I was already asking people for spare change to get alcohol so I could drink after school. You know, my mom would go, like Glenn talked about my mom. He had, had my mom speak a lot of times. He taped her. My mom would speak at conventions every weekend and I would steal her truck for the weekend. My mom went to Kansas. I had a full blown party at her house. You know what I mean? Like I had no respect for my mom who I loved she was my hero. Man. My mom was my hero and I had zero respect. Alcohol was making decisions for my life, though I couldn't see it. Right. My mom said, you can't drink in my house. And so I heard hide it better. I heard my mom say, you need to hide the booze better because, <laughs> but what she said is you can't drink here. And um, I heard, I, I learned I have a hearing problem. Yeah, Stephen, I don't know if you have a hearing problem, but I have a hearing problem. Alcohol tells me things that aren't reality. You know what I'm saying? It's talking to me, telling me that it's okay for me to drink, right? You're not hurting anybody but yourself, man. How long have we been saying that for, man? And uh, and so my mom found a bag of weed in her house. I came home just wasted, drunk, you know, and thinking I could sneak in. And I was 17 years old, and my mom said, you're kicked out of the house. And this is how I know I have a hearing problem, <laughs> Because my mom said to me that day, she said, you can stay here and be sober or go out on the streets and get loaded, but you need to make a choice. Here I am thinking that I'm making a choice, not knowing that alcohol is already making decisions for me. I heard you're kicked out of the house. And I went in my bedroom, I packed my backpack at 17 and I walked by my mom and I looked at her right in the eyes and I said, I'm going to do everything I can to ruin your life. And I watched my mom's heart break right in that moment. Now, I don't know how you deal with shame and guilt, but this alcoholic arrogance came out. I puffed my chest. I grabbed my mom by the collar. I sent her against the wall. F you. I hate you. You're never going to see me again. And I broke my mom's heart in that moment. 
And I left my mom's house at 17 years old and I wouldn't get sober until I was 27. And I didn't call my mom for a year, about a year and four months because I was going to make her pay for that decision. Here's my mom, my hero, my best friend, right? And alcohol is already making decisions for me. And I'm saying things like, if you would just leave me alone, everything would be all right. If you would just let me do what I want to do, everything would be all right. If you just stay that heck out of my way, everything would be all right, you know? And, uh, you know, and, and, and it was, uh, it was a painful road, but I've already talked about my alcoholism. I've already talked about once I put alcohol in my body, it has the power, the powerful aspect that it connects me to you. And it makes decisions for me. And it tells every, it tells me that everybody in my life is a liar, a failure. They're getting your way. They're going to screw you over. I have a ninth grade education. School doesn't matter. I went to juvenile hall. That's not a problem, right? My alcohol is already making decisions in my life at 17 and I can't see it. Right. And at 27 years old, um, I'm living on skid row. I'd been living on skid row for, for a year and a half. Um, I went to treatment when I was 25 and I got out of treatment, um, not knowing that I was an alcoholic, knowing I was a drug addict and uh, going in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, drug addict, not alcoholic, you know, and I go to AA and I say I'm an addict, you know, because my mom would tell me to go to AA. And so I would go to AA and and, uh, and I would say, my name is Pat and I'm an addict. And, and you, I don't know how you guys are and how your groups are, but pe- people were like, you know, there's no addicts welcome here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You may need another fellowship. Right. People were guiding me to another fellowship before they talked about alcoholism. Right. They didn't let me diagnose myself. They told me where I needed to go. And I'm so grateful that the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is a self-diagnosis process, you know, and I would leave AA and I'd go out there and I'd die. And I'd come back to AA um, identifying as an addict alcoholic, you know, and they would say, put two dollars in the basket, you know, because some are sicker than others, you know. And there was this judgment in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that that um that pushed me out of here, you know, and uh, you know, I, it still brings up a lot of emotion for me, you know. I'm I'm a 12 tradition guy. I love the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you know, and that's just not how I read it, but that's just that's just what happened in my life, you know. And um and uh, on the 20th, I got sober on the 23rd of October. On the 20th of October, I came out of a motel, sexually assaulted for the 12th time, and. Um, I had so much shame and guilt and self-hate and I was just terrified and I was alone. And, um, and I knew that the drugs were causing just bad things in my life. Right. But I also knew that if I could get a pint of tequila, everything would be all right. And, um, I went to the liquor store and we were outside. It was five 30 in the morning. We were walking in circle. You can't buy alcohol till six in California. And, um, It was the longest 30 minutes of my life, you know, and um, the voices in my head were so loud. The anxiety was so intense. And the lady opened the door to open the liquor store. And and I got that sense of ease and comfort, just knowing that 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 I could get alcohol. Right. And I walked in that liquor store and I got a pint of tequila and I put that pint of tequila back and and I blacked out. And um, I had gotten that sense of ease and comfort. And I blacked out because I always overshoot the mark. And um Three days later, I came to and and I and I had a spiritual defense that stepped in between me and that first thought and that spiritual defense said, call your mom and ask for help. And I picked up the phone and I said, mom, I need help. And my mom said, I can't help you anymore. She said, just stay right where you are. And someone from Alcoholics Anonymous will come and get you. She said, if I come and get you, I'm going to end up killing you. And she hung up on me. You know, and I know that my mom wasn't going to come with a loaded gun and, and kill her only kid. I know that my mom loved me more than anything in the world, anything in the planet. You know, I know that my mom wanted to help me so bad, but my mom, me and my mom and God taking my mom through the ringer, you know, she, she'd gotten beaten up by my alcoholism, right? Because I would call her and say, I need help. And she'd wire me money and I'd call her and I needed help and she'd wire me some money, you know, and I'd always call her with help and having a plan attached to that. And, and she would want to help me with the plan. And, and my mom got beat up by my alcoholism. And, and I know because me and my mom spoke at a lot of places that that was my, that the words that she said that day weren't her words, but were the words of God that God intervened that day. And, um, and she said, I can't help you anymore. And she said, you just stay right where you are. And someone from Alcoholics Anonymous will come and get you. And, um, 
you know, and she tried to call call every high profile old timer in her area and none of them picked up the phone. And the one guy that picked up the phone was on fire for it. He had a year sober. You know, the guy at the year sober, man, he had the big book in his hand, man. He had just gotten the call that he was going to, that he, that by his doctor, that he, that he had four stage cancer and he had six months to live. And he knew that he needed to treat his alcoholism because that next call that he got was from my mom. And he didn't say, have the kid call me. He said, where's he at? He got the address. And he ran down and he got a new guy with 90 days sober, right? And he showed up to that motel and they told their stories all the way till they got to that motel that day. And they barged in and the guy goes, my name's Jack and I'm an alcoholic. Like he had crazy hair. So the guy was on a walker. He goes, my name's John. I got 90 days sober. You know what I mean? I'm thinking losers, man. Here I am, right? Separating myself from you, separating myself from the message of Alcoholics Anonymous disconnecting that spiritual malady, right? Don't go with these guys. These guys are going to hurt you. They're losers. They don't understand, right? Your case is different. They don't have your story, right? And I know that the grace of God entered my life that day because that guy, Jack, said, come with me, kid. And I got off the bed and I followed that guy at that motel. And I got down to the van. He goes, just get in the van, kid. And I didn't say where we're going. I just got in the van, right? I didn't believe in God until I was 10 years sober, I didn't believe in God until I was 10 years sober, but I know that the grace of God entered my life that day because I got in the van. And those guys told me their story. I'm so grateful that we're a storytelling society. You know, we come here and we tell our stories. There's no lectures to be endured. I, I can, I can talk about this big book all day long. Right. And unless I'm, unless I'm directed like tomorrow night, I'll do a 10 and 11 and 12 talk. Right. But like we come here and we tell our stories, you know, and I'm so grateful because those guys told me their stories, man. They told me their story and they laughed and they told me their story and they laughed and they told me their story and they laughed. And before he knew it, I ended up in a place called Charlie street. It was a low bottom indigent detox. You know, there was no therapist. There was no, there no, no meds, man. It was like, there's a cot. Good luck, kid. And they sat down with me in that bed and they read this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, word for word. And as they read word for word, they told me their story as it related to the big book. And the guy talked about every time him, that he drank, the only time he could stop was when he went to the hospital. And my mind is separating, right? It's saying, you don't go to the hospital, Pat. You go to jail, right? And he could see that I was separating, right? That I was kind of leaning back on, yeah. <laughs> This isn't for me. And he said, Pat, when you drink, what happens to you? And I said, well, I started telling him, I said, this one time I drank and, and, uh, and he goes, yeah, okay. You drank. He said, what happened? Like, did you, when did you stop? I said, well, the only time I stopped was on when I went to jail. He said, really? I said, yeah, this one time I drank, I went to jail. So other time I drank, I went to jail. Now he didn't drink and go to jail, but he knew a guy that drank and went to jail. And so he said, hey, Pete, come on over. I got this new guy, Pat. And Pete came over and Pete sat down and Pete started telling me his story and Pete drank and Pete went to jail. And I laughed. <laughs> I laughed. Right, Stephen? I see you laughing over there. Right? Gotcha. Right? And what happened was, was like, man, I got it, man. I was like, there was this identification happened. I wasn't different than Pete. My mind that was trying to separate me, all of a sudden I was connected. All of a sudden I was connected. And then, then he goes, what happens to you when you're in jail, Pete? So Pete told me the story. He goes, man, I was never an alcoholic. I was always a dope fiend. I was like, do me too. This one time, drugs, 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 got out of jail, drank, back in jail. He said, really, back in jail? I said, yeah, back in jail, back in jail, drank, back in jail, drank, back in jail. He looked at me and said, Pat, if you can concede both propositions, physical, that when you put alcohol in your body, you can't stop until you end up in jail. And more importantly, in jail with a sober mind, you have a mind that's always driving you back to alcohol. He said, you might be alcoholic. And I'm so grateful that he left me with might. He left me with me. And if you're left with, some, with, 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 with the facts that are, what he laid down the facts about himself. He laid about the facts about alcoholism as it's laid out in the book. And he left me with this identification of me. I could not lie to myself in that moment. I could not think of a, of a thing that would separate me. And I looked at him and I said, I'm alcoholic, Jack. 
And he lit up like a chandelier, man. He got excited. He was like, I got a new guy. You know what I mean? And uh, because the light came on, man, you know, when, when the light comes on, right? When, when, when the light comes on, we get that guy. And it's just like, he's in, right? The greatest gift you guys gave me was the gift of identification because I was no longer different from you. Every time I came to AA and identified as an addict, I separated myself from you. Every time I came to AA and said I was an alcoholic and I separated myself from you. And when I became an alcoholic, right, he said, come all the way in and sit all the way down, kid. And I was right in the middle of you guys, which meant I had to do what you told me to do. And he said, I want you to dumb a TV two directions. I'm going to, I want you to read, go to your little room and read the big book. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to take a shower. You know, and it had been six months. And I thought, how did he know? You know, and uh, that's how delusional I was sitting on the couch thinking, man, do these guys ever clean the couches? You know, and uh, not knowing it was me, you know? And, and so I went to the little, my little room and I read the big book and Bill W and stockbroker and ticket tape. And I didn't identify, I didn't, I didn't understand what the, I can't even comprehend what was in the book. But I took my first right action and uh, and I went to my little shower, little detox room and I turned the water on. I fell down on the ground. And I started to cry, you know, and uh, day one, man, I was on the floor in tears, just crying and crying and crying. I'm just broken on the floor. And uh, that guy, Jack, came in that day of that detox and he got down on the floor at me and he held on to me down there and he rubbed my shoulder like this. He said, kid, it's going to be all right, kid. It's going to be all right, kid. It's going to be all right, you know, and um. I know it was the power of God today, but something happened inside of me, you know, and I turned and I looked at this guy and he looked right into my soul. And he said, I love you, kid. He said, I love you, kid. He said, can you stand up? And I stood up and he said, I want you to take off your shirt. I took off my shirt and he said, I want you to take step in the shower. I stepped in. I took another step in. That guy was halfway in the shower with me, holding me up in the water. And I was just shaking. Ter- I was terrified, right? And I was terrified to get in that water because the water hurt my skin. And that guy took a washcloth and that guy took a bar of soap and the man scrubbed my back, you know? And um, for the first time in my life, I was 27 years old. And for the first time in my life, I felt love from another human being. And uh, you know, the same love that I was met with when I walked into the Zoom room or, or sat in my chair, you know, and walked in the Zoom room, the same love that I felt when Glenn asked me to participate in my recovery today. And, you know, the same love that, it, that I felt on day one is the same love that I get when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and it was a hook that just pulled me right into this thing, you know, day one, man, day one, I sat down and he said, do you believe in God? I said, I'm not going to believe in God. If this is a God deal, I'm out. And he talked about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, right? Giving him joy when he walked his daughter down the aisle, right? And in that moment, I got hope, right? In that moment, he gave me hope that I too could experience joy in my life, right? And, uh, and so I turned my, my will and life over to that sponsor that, that day. And I said, I'm willing to do it. You guys tell me to do an Alcoholics Anonymous. And I wrote inventory. And I, that day, I, 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 I read, told him, read my inventory that I had, you know? And I sat down with him and we talked about the mistakes in my life. And, and uh, day four, I made an amends and, you know, and, uh, and uh, 90 days, I made amends to my mom. And my mom said, I just want you to get in the middle of AA and help people. And, and Jack said, what about the money? I said, she didn't want the money, Jack, you know. And they said, yeah, but AA wants you to pay it back. And I said, how am I going to pay her $100,000? She said, $25 at a time, you know. And, uh. And so I have wrote, give my mom $25 a week, $25 a week. And I do an Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and um, he said, I want you to write a note that says, mom, I love you. And I appreciate you. And leave her 25 bucks. And I write the note and I leave the 25 bucks. And I write the note and I leave the 25 bucks. And then he said, you're doing such a good job. I want you to write the note every day. And so I started writing the note every day. And the notes started to change, you know what I mean? And they started to talk, t- talk to my mom and I st- started telling her she was my hero and she was my best friend. And I started talking about all the good things that she did in my life. And um, five years sober, my, my sponsor, he um, or my mom sat, sat me down and she said, I no longer want the money anymore, but I still want the notes, you know? And um, I had no idea what that note was going to do. You know, if it would have been up to me, I'd have shortchanged myself, I'll tell you that. I can tell you, I wrote my mom a note, sent my mom a text or gave my mom a call just about every day until the day that my mom died, you know, and um, at eight years of sobriety, I, I, I was dying of untreated alcoholism and I was going to kill myself. And um, 
I called a guy and he, he, uh, he took me back through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and I didn't believe in God. That's what the problem was. And my behavior was horrendous in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and um, here I am speaking all over the place, committees everywhere. And I couldn't be faithful in any relationship I was in, you know, and, um, and I couldn't handle the pain anymore. And I was going to die. And, and um, this guy took me back through the steps and I came to believe, I came to find out that God was love for me, you know, I came to find out that God was this intuitive thought I had my whole life, that God was on the inside, right, of me. I was always looking on the outside for God, and I could never experience that, you know. And um, I always thought that God was in the sky zapping me, you know, testing me, you know. And um, I came to find out that God was love. And I remember making a decision with my sponsor um, to follow the spirit within you know, we read it. We read it today in in, um, in the daily reflections. Well, we were talked about how we 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 stay with the spirit. You know, and um, my favorite my favorite promise is actually in the tenth step, right after that little reading we did. It says we have entered the world of the spirit, and the, the ninth step promises are so beautiful. You know, but but that that prom the promises in the tenth step really resonate with me. You know, it talks about um, um, we've entered. You know that 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 by this time sanity will have returned. And, you know, I didn't experience that the first round through the steps. I didn't experience that until I was uh, 10 years sober when I finally made amends to my dad. You know, I was suicidal in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous for a year, not willing to make amends to my dad. I made amends to every girlfriend that I, that I was unfaithful to. You know, I, I remember sitting down, sitting down with the, with, the with, with one of them. And I said, I said, uh, you know, is it, I, I said the harm. And then I said, is there anything else that I'm unaware of? And she said, Pat, you know, she said, everyone that I dated after you paid the price of your behavior to me because I couldn't trust another human being, you know? And like, I got to get present to write the effect, the ripple effect that my behavior had on many, many, many different people, right? And, um, you know, I remember, I remember asking her how, she, how it made her feel and I had to sit and listen, man. And I cried, man. I cried and cried and cried and got present to, the, the, to, to how my fear in life generated these behaviors, right? That, um, that caused harm to so many people. And and, um, and I started to get free, right? I started to get in touch with the spirit within. I started to separate, right, myself from the fear, self-centered, consumed with me stuff, right, that, dr that the mind drives me to. And I started to get in touch with the spirit. And I was free, but I wasn't unhooked. And, uh, you know, at, at 10 years sober, I finally said, man, I'm done. I'm going to kill myself. I can't do it. And um, I pulled my car off on a bridge and I was going to jump off and I didn't go to my sponsor, man. Cause I knew he was going to tell me to go to AA or do some prayer or, or make amends to my dad. You know, one of those little, you know, things they weren't going to tell you. I didn't want to do it, man. So I said, went to God for the first time in my life. And I said, God, you have 10 seconds because I'm going to kill myself. I went from dependence upon human to dependence upon God for the first time in my life. And I got to the front of my car and, and I, my phone rang and it was an unknown number. And I answered it that day. And it was a kid I helped get sober. And he was calling me to thank me for saving his life, but he was leaving AA and he was going to go get loaded. And I, I started to 12 step this kid on the bridge about to jump off. <laughs> and I started to talk about my thinking that precedes the first drink, you know, and, and intuitively I, 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 there, I just was like, there's a meeting starting right now. And I asked him if he would meet me there and he met me there and I walked in and Chris was crying and, Chris thanked me for saving his life one more time and asked me if I'd be a sponsor, you know? And uh, I got home that night and I was cussing out God. Why do you got to, why do you got to put a new, new guy in my life? I just want to die. You know, I felt this hand on my shoulder and it pushed me off and, and I was on the floor and I was just screaming. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And I started to make amends to a man I never met. You know, my mom got pregnant in a blackout. I don't have a part in that, that, that relationship. But where had I been selfish and self-centered? Remember that little boy on the, on, the, on the baseball field? I got the triple play in the wrong direction. He looked at his mom and he said, if I only had a dad, that would have never happened. I carried on that old idea all the way until that moment when I made amends to my dad. And I could see that in every relationship in my life, if I only had a dad, I know how to be a boyfriend to you. If I only had a dad, know how to be a, a friend to you. If I only had a dad, know how to show up for work. If I only had a dad to teach me these things in life, right? I wouldn't be the, the, the man I am today. And what happened for me in that moment was the victim was pulled out and the power of God, which was love, went deep down within, you know? 
And, um, and from that moment, I went to my bed that night and I've fallen asleep just like that every night. And I know that when my sleep patterns are messed up, right? I have a 10th and 11th step issue, don't I? Because I've entered the world of the spirit, right? When I entered the world of the spirit, when I was free of all that resentment and fear and any shame and any guilt and making every relationship right in my life, I had entered the world of the spirit, right? I was able to feel and to understand when it was off on the inside, right? This is a spiritual program, right? This is a spiritual deal. And, uh, and, and I know, right, when I started off that this whole idea, right, of like, you may lose your job, right, is this fear based, right? Right? I look at the fear, I call my sponsor, I said, this is a fear that's going on in my life. This is what's happening for me right now, right? It's we said in the reading, when these crop up, we look, we pray about it, we talk about it, right? And then we, if we make amends, we need to make amends. And then we turn our re- thoughts and attentions to who we can help, right? And when I can stay within that space, what happens for me is I am a vessel for God to use to help other people. I can be present for you. I can be open for you, right? I can be available to you, right? It's not about me today. It's about you. The more of you, the less of me, God comes in and takes care of my problems. I know that when I'm working with you, God's taking care of it. Whenever I'm focusing on my problems, my problems always seem to pile up. They seem overwhelming and they seem like I can't take care of it, you know? And, um, you know, and um, I have uh, six minutes and uh, I'm going to talk about the amends with my mom. And uh, me and my mom, were, we, 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 were, we were able to, uh, to speak all over the country together. She. Um, she had COPD. Uh, she got it when I was about a year sober, but she wouldn't wear the oxygen <laughs> and uh, pride, you know, and uh, at, right before her 40th AA birthday party, she, she ended up in the hospital on life support. And, uh, you know, and we don't, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it was my son. I think it was God, but I really think it was her want to get to her 40th AA birthday, birthday party, but they pulled the, pulled the oxygen out and she lived. She made it to her 40th birthday party, man. And she lived the last, um, you know, three years of her life to the fullest. You know, I mean, she was with oxygen, was speaking all over the country with oxygen, was was at five meetings a week with oxygen, was working with sponsees. You know, she was crushing it and it was hard for her. It was really hard for her. And and I would go every Monday night to have dinner with my mom because it was part of my amends and you know, and I would drive an hour in traffic to get my kid to drive an hour to go meet her to sit with her for 45 minutes so she can bark at me for biting my nails and bound having anxiety, you know, and and then I, I, but I was just so I was like, why do I got to do this, man? I was over it. I was like, dude, I I can't stand this lady. She's on my nerves all the time. And, and I remember talking to my friend, Michelle Lyon, and, 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 um, and I said, I can't do it anymore. And she said, you're gonna have to teach your mom how to love you. I was like, teach my mom how to love me. You know, I mean, I'm 40, you know, she's 40 years sober. She should be teaching me, you know, and uh, back to that little boy, right? Back to that little boy living in those old ideas. And, and uh, you know, my mom was like hugging a cactus, you know what I'm saying? Like she loved you guys, but man, it was, it was, it was, yeah, anyways, but you know, and, and so I started teaching my mom how to love me. You know, I started, I, I'm, I'm sensitive. I'm, I'm touchy. I grab her and kiss her on the forehead. She'd get so uncomfortable and and I would just teach her how to love me and, and, and uh, te- yeah, and we were in Nashville, Tennessee, and I uh, got off the plane to go help, to go, to go speak. And my mom wouldn't get in the, in the wheelchair. And I was like, mom, just get in the wheelchair, man, please just get in the wheelchair. So I'm not getting that guy in our wheelchair. And I remember looking at her saying, mom, when are you going to let me love you? And she sat in the wheelchair and I started pushing my mom and I was so proud. You know what I mean? I was so proud pushing my mom and and all of a sudden there was this hill that started going down. I got excited. You know what I mean? I got an alcoholic idea and I started running and I started, all of a sudden I started running and she was yelling at me, stop running, stop running. And I just kicked my feet up in the air and the wheelchair was like, wah, like this. And she's freaking out. And uh, we got to the bottom and I looked at her and she was laughing and I was laughing and I said, got him, you know, and we got to the hotel that night and, and I, and uh, we went to sleep. I told my mom, I loved her. And and uh, the next morning I got in the shower and I turned the water on and all this red dye water started coming out of the shower head. And my mom had snuck in there and put a little red dye tablet in there. And it came out of the bathroom and she was flipping me off. She goes, gotcha. You know, 
And uh, what happened was we started to have this innocent relationship, you know what I mean? And, uh, oh man, I wish I had more time to talk about my mom, but I couldn't get into Canada. I spoke speaking in Canada. She said, you don't worry, just come with me. And she was in a wheelchair and she started flirting with the, with the immigration guys so hard. I mean, she was flirting with them so hard that they just, they were so uncomfortable. They just stamped the thing. They go, go ahead. You know? And, uh, she was a, she was a riot, you know? And, um, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, we were at my home group one night and, and my mom would get there at six o'clock, five o'clock and make sure the meeting was put together for an eight o'clock meeting. We'd all go to dinner and she would pass the baskets. And after the meeting, she'd call me and complain about the speaker like she always did. And that night she went home and she couldn't breathe. And we rushed her to the hospital and they diagnosed her with lung cancer. She had a tumor that blocked the passageway and she couldn't breathe. And they cored the tumor out and they put her on hospice, you know. And I knew it was the end. I knew it was the end. And, and um, I didn't want to believe it. You know, I didn't want to believe it. And I, my mom said, I'm getting on. I'm going, I'm only going on hospice to get off hospice. Don't worry about it, Patrick. Sure enough, two weeks later, my mom was off that hospice bed back at the home group. You know what I mean? They're early back passing the baskets, you know, call me after the meeting. She's like, yeah, that speaker. Oh, geez. You know, and, uh, that night she went, we had to rush her back to the hospital. She couldn't breathe. And that tumor had grown back in two weeks. And, uh, I had gone to enough meetings, guys. I had listened to your stories. You guys would tell me that the greatest gift that AA gave you was that you were there when the, where loved one took their last breath. I wanted your experience so bad. How many times we want someone else's experience, but we don't want to walk through our own. It's too painful. And I was going to speak in, in Idaho at, at the Wacky Paw Young People Convention, and I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to miss my mom's last breath. And I pray about it, and I pray about it. And a message came, you need to be a service day. Hey, I don't like that message. So I pray again the next day, and I don't like that message. I, you know, I do this for three days. I finally call my sponsor. He said, what did God say, kid? I said, oh, God told me to be a service to Alcoholics Anonymous. He said, then that's what you need to do. I said, okay. I got on, like, went to see my mom. I kissed her on the forehead. I said, I'll be back, mom. And, you know, my mom wouldn't let me sit there and watch her die day in and day out. She'd tell me every day, go live your life, kid. Make sure you come back and see me tomorrow and give me a kiss. And I'd go see my mom in hospice, and I can only be there for 10 minutes because my mom didn't want me there. She wanted me to go live my life. And um, I said, mom, I'll be back. And I left to Idaho to go speak. And Saturday, I was the Saturday night speaker and they, my, my mom's friends called me. They said, your mom's been unresponsive and she hasn't moved and you need to hurry up and get back. Your mom's going to die. And I went and got on my knees and I prayed. I said, God, what do you want me to do? And I heard God tell me you need to be a service to alcoholics. Anonymous. And I was so terrified. I knew what the right thing to do was. I went that night and I, I shared at the Wacky Paw convention and I don't even know what the heck I said, you know. And uh, the next day I got on a plane, I flew home and I raced in, I get into my mom's room, hospice room and my mom sat straight up like this and she put her arms out. Now my mom hadn't moved in three days and she hadn't talked in three days. And I walked in the hospice room, my mom sat straight up, she put her arms out like this. Spirit, felt spirit walk in the room that day. And I have entered the world of the spirit and I would have missed the moment if I wasn't willing to make amends to my dad, if I wasn't willing to unhook myself from the prison in my own mind, I would have missed that moment. And I went into my mom's arms and she put her arms around me and she said, Pato, I want you to know you did the right thing. She held on to me. She said, I love you. I love you. I love you. And that was the last words that my mom said. But what happened for me in that moment was there was a, le a level of forgiveness that was so profound. All my mom wanted me to do was to get in the middle of AA and help you. And I can tell you that I honored my mom's amends all the way until the day that my mom died. I remember kissing my mom on the forehead. I said, mom, I want you to know from this day forward, I'll make sure to carry on the legacy of you. And um, so I wake up every morning. And I say, God, please put someone in my life I can help. It's my responsibility to be of service to you. God's in the results business. And I know today. That whatever's going on in my life, right, this whole thing with work, that God's got a bigger plan for me. If you're new here in Alcoholics Anonymous, my message today is that Alcoholics Anonymous a lot more just not drinking. 
Alcoholics Anonymous is a process of growing up. And I thank you, Glenn, one more time for allowing me to participate in my recovery and growing up just a little bit more. I love you all. Thank you so much.